So Sam Altman recently sat down with Alex Kantrowitz, the host of the Big Technology Podcast. And he talked about how OpenAI is changing, not in terms of one new model or feature, but in terms of where the real growth is coming from, how AI is actually getting used day to day, and what happens once it starts doing more than just answering questions. And by the end, he even starts questioning whether AGI or super intelligence is the right term anymore and throws out a very different way to think about it. Let's get into it. All right, so the first shift he points to is where OpenAI's growth is actually coming from now. A lot of people still think of OpenAI as mainly a consumer company, but Altman says that changed this year. Our strategy was always consumer first. Uh, there were a few reasons for that. One, the models were not robust and skilled enough uh, for most enterprise uses, and now now they're they're getting there. The second was we had this like clear opportunity to win in consumer, and those are rare and hard to come by. And I think if you win in consumer, it makes it massively easier to win in enterprise. And we are we are seeing that now. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, this was a year where we enterprise growth outpaced consumer growth. Uh, and given where the models are today, where they will get to next year, we think this is the time where we can build a really significant enterprise business quite rapidly. I mean, I think we already have one, but it can it can grow much more. Um, companies seem ready for it. The technology seems ready for it. The, you know, coding is the biggest example so far, but there are others that are now growing, other verticals that are now growing very quickly. And we're starting to hear enterprises say, you know, I really just want an AI platform. Which vertical company? Um, finance. Science is the one I'm most excited about of everything happening right now, personally. Um, customer support is doing great. So if OpenAI is shifting toward enterprise, the obvious question is, what does that mean for jobs? The interviewer brings up a real example of someone whose job turned into managing AI agents and then eventually getting replaced by them. And Altman's response here is pretty revealing. Check this out. I know you're not an economist, so I'm not going to ask you, like, what is the macro impact on jobs? But let me just read you one uh, line that I heard, uh, you know, in, in terms of how this impacts jobs uh, from Blood in the Machine on Substack. Um, this is from a technical copywriter. They said, chatbots came in and made it so my job was managing the bots instead of a team of reps. Okay, that, that to me seems like it's going to happen often. But then this person continued and said, once the bots were sufficiently trained up to offer good enough support, then I was out. Um, is that, is that the, is that going to become more common? Is that what bad companies are going to do? Because if you have a human who's going to be able to sort of orchestrate a bunch of different bots, then you might want to keep them. I don't know. How do you think about this? So I, I agree with you that it's clear to see how everyone's going to be managing like a lot of AIs, uh, doing different stuff. Um, Eventually, like any good manager, hopefully your team gets better and better, but you just take on more scope and more responsibility. I am not I am not a job stoomer. Um, short term, I have some worry. I think the transition is likely to be rough uh, in some cases, but we are so deeply wired to care about other people, what other people do. We are so, we seem to be so focused on relative status and always wanting more and to be of use and service to express creative spirit whatever 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 has driven us this long i don't think that's going away now i do think the jobs of the future or i don't even know if jobs is the right word whatever we're all going to do all day in 2050 probably looks very different than it does today um but i but i i don't have any of this like oh life is going to be without meaning and the economy is going to totally break like we will find i hope much more meaning and the economy i think will significantly change but I, I think you just don't bet against evolutionary biology um you know i think a lot about how we can automate all the functions at open ai and then even more than that i think about like what it means to have an ai ceo of open ai it doesn't bother me i'm like thrilled for it i won't fight it uh like i don't want to be i don't want to be the person hanging on being like i can do this better the, the handmade way ai ceo just make a bunch of decisions to sort of like direct all of our resources to giving ai more energy and power it's like um i mean no you would really you put a guard, guardrail on <laughs> yeah like 
obviously you don't want an AI CEO that is not governed by humans. But if you think about, if if you think about maybe like, a, this is a, a crazy analogy, but I'll give it anyway. If you think about a version where like every person in the world was effectively on the board of directors of an AI company and got to, you know, tell the AI CEO what to do and fire them if they weren't doing a good job at that and, you know, got governance on the decisions, but the AI CEO got to try to like execute the wishes of the board. Um, I think to people of the future, that might seem like quite a reasonable thing. So yeah, he admits the short-term transition will probably be rough, but his view is that the idea of a job just changes. We move from actually doing the work to managing the work being done. And while that sounds reasonable in theory, I'm not convinced it plays out that cleanly in practice. I mean, I agree with him that humans care deeply about other humans, and that that's not going away anytime soon. And I wouldn't necessarily call myself a jobs doomer either. But I just don't see how everyone gets to participate in this future, especially when you can just have intelligent AIs supervising other, less intelligent AIs. Now, maybe the pie really does get so much bigger that the idea of jobs stops mattering altogether, whatever jobs even look like at that point. But that immediately raises questions about meaning, about purpose, how this affects society, the economy, basically all the existential stuff we keep coming back to on this channel. And this is where Altman's argument about scale really matters. Because whether this future works out or not comes down to one assumption that demand for intelligence keeps growing and keeps growing fast. That's what all this enterprise expansion, automation, and restructuring is built upon. And it's also why OpenAI is willing to bet so heavily on compute in the first place. The whole world is wondering um, how your revenue will line up with the spend. Uh, the question's been asked if the trajectory is to hit $20 billion in revenue this year, and the, the spend commitment is $1.4 trillion. Um, so I think it would be great just Again, to lay out. Again, over a very long period. Yeah, of time. over. And, and that's why I wanted to bring it up to you. I think it would be great to just lay it out for everyone once and for all how those numbers are going to work. It's it's very hard to like really. I, I, I find that one thing, I certainly can't do it. And very few people I've ever met can do it. You know, you can like, you have good intuition for a lot of mathematical things in your head. But exponential growth is usually very hard for people to do a good, quick mental framework on. Like for whatever reason, there were a lot of things that evolution needed us to be able to do well with math in our heads. Modeling exponential growth doesn't seem to be one of them. Um, so the thing we believe is that we can stay on a very steep growth curve of revenue for quite a while. And everything we see right now continues to indicate that. We cannot do it if we don't have the compute. Uh, again, we're so compute constrained uh, and it hits the revenue line so hard that I think if we get to a point where we have like a lot of compute sitting around that we can't monetize on a you know profitable per unit of compute basis, be very reasonable to say, okay, this is like a little, how's this all going to work? But we've penciled this out a bunch of ways. Uh, we will, of course, also get more efficient uh, on like a flops per dollar basis as, you know, all of the work we've been doing to make compute cheaper comes to pass. Um, but we see this consumer growth. We see this enterprise growth. There's a whole bunch of new kinds of businesses that have we haven't even launched yet, but will. Um, but compute is really the lifeblood that enables all of this. So we, you know, there's like checkpoints along the way. And if we're a little bit wrong about our timing or math, we can, we have some flexibility, but we have always been in a compute deficit. It has always constrained what we're able to do. Uh, I unfortunately think it will always be the case, but I wish it were less the case. And I'd like to get it to be less of the case over time. Uh, Cause I think there's so many great products and services that we can deliver and it'll be a great business. Okay. So it's effectively training costs go down as a percentage. They as go up massively overall, but yeah. And then your expectation is through things like this, this enterprise push, through things like people being willing uh, to pay for ChatGPT, through the API, OpenAI will be able to grow revenue enough to pay for it with revenue. Yeah, that is the plan. 
So here's where things get really interesting. Because even if you buy the idea of exponential growth and rising demand, there's still an obvious question. What if progress suddenly slows down? What if we overbuild? Well, Altman's take is that this actually isn't the problem. The real issue is that we're not even close to using what these models can already do. Check this out. I think the, the fear is that um, if things don't continue at pace, like here's one scenario, um, and, and you'll probably disagree with this, but like the model progress saturates, uh, then the the infrastructure becomes worth less than the anticipated value was. And then, yes, those data centers will be worth something to someone, but it could be that they get liquidated and someone buys them at a discount. Yeah, and I, and I do suspect, by the way, there will be some like booms and busts along the way. These things are never a perfectly smooth line. Um, first of all, it seems very clear to me, and this is uh, like a thing I happily would bet the company on, that the models are going to get much, much better. We have like a pretty good window into this we're very confident about that. Even if they did not, I think the there's like a lot of inertia in the world. It takes a while to figure out how to adapt to things. The overhang of the economic value that I believe 5.2 represents relative to what the world has figured out how to get out of it so far is so huge that even if you froze the model at 5.2, how much more like value can you create and thus revenue can you drive? I bet a huge amount. In fact, you didn't ask this, but if I can go on a rant for a second. Um, we used to talk a lot about this two-by-two two matrix of short timelines, long timelines, slow takeoff, fast takeoff, and where we felt at different times the kind of probability was shifting and that that was going to be, you could kind of understand a lot of the decisions and strategy that the world should optimize for based off of where you were going to be on that two-by-two two matrix. Um There's like a z-axis in my head, in my picture of this that's emerged, which is small overhang, big overhang. And I I kind of thought that, I guess I didn't think about that hard, but uh, like my retro on this is I must have assumed that the overhang was not going to be that massive, that if the models had a lot of value in them, the world was pretty quickly going to figure out how to deploy that. But it looks to me now like the overhang is going to be massive in most of the world. You'll have these like areas like, you know, some some set of coders that'll get massively more productive by adopting these tools. But on the whole, you have this crazy smart model that, to be perfectly honest, most people are still asking this similar questions they did in the GPT-4 realm. Scientists, different coders, different. Maybe knowledge work is going to get different. But, but there is a huge overhang. And... That has a bunch of very strange consequences for the world. I, we have not wrapped our head around all the ways that's going to play out yet, but it's very much not what I would have expected a few years ago. So when you zoom out, this is what the new phase actually looks like. OpenAI isn't just scaling models. It's scaling into enterprise, reshaping how work gets done. And Altman believes they're already sitting on more capability than the world knows how to use. That's when the interview brings up the term AGI and asks him directly whether he thinks we already have it. And instead of embracing the label, Altman basically argues that we never defined it properly in the first place. Just take a look at this. You told him, this was right before GPT-5 came out, that GPT-5 is smarter than us in almost every way. Uh, I, I thought that that was the definition of AGI. Does, is that, isn't that AGI? And, and if not has the term become somewhat meaningless. These models are clearly extremely smart on a sort of raw horsepower basis. You know, there's all this stuff out in the last couple of days about GPT-5.2 as an IQ of 147 or 144 or 151 or whatever it is. It's like, you know, depending on whose test, it's like, it's some high number. And you have like a lot of experts in their field saying it can do these amazing things and it's like contributing, it's making it more effective. You have the GDP value things we talked about. One thing you don't have is the ability for the model to not be able to do something today, realize it can't, go off and figure out how to learn to get good at that thing, learn to understand it. And when you come back the next day, it gets it right. And that kind of continuous learning, like toddlers can do it. It does seem to me like an important part of what we need to build. Now, can you have something that most people would consider an AGI without that? I would say 
clear. I mean, there's a lot of people that would say we're at AGI with our current models. Um, I think almost everyone would agree that if we were at the current level of intelligence and had that other thing, it would clearly be very AGI-like. Um, but maybe most of the world will say, okay, fine, even without that, like it's doing most knowledge tasks that matter, um, smarter than us and mo most of us in most ways, we're at AGI. You know, it's discovering small piece of new science, we're at AGI. What I think this means is that the term, although it's been very hard for all of us to stop using, is very underdefined. Right. I I have a I have a a candidate a, a, like one thing I would love. Once we got it wrong with AGI, we never defined that. That you know the new term everyone's focused about is when we get to super intelligence. Um. So my proposal is that we agree that you know AGI kind of went whooshing by. It was didn't change the world that much, or it will in the long term. But okay, fine. We built AGIs. At some point, you know, we're in this like fuzzy period where some people think we have and some people think we have and more people think we have. And and then we'll say, OK, what's next? Um, a candidate definition for super intelligence is when a system can do a better job being president of the United States, CEO of a major company, you know, running a very large scientific lab than any person can, even with the assistance of AI. I think this was an interesting thing about what happened with chess, where chess got, it could be humans. I remember this very vividly, uh, the deep blue thing. And then there was a period of time where a human and the AI together were better than an AI by itself. And then the person was just making it worse. And the smartest thing was the unaided AI that didn't have the human, like not understanding its, its great intelligence. Um, I think something like that is like an interesting framework for super intelligence. I think it's like a long way off, but I would love to have like a cleaner definition this time around. So yeah, that's how it ends. If AGI just means doing most knowledge work better than most people, then a lot of folks would argue we're already there. The issue isn't capability, it's deployment. We haven't reorganized work, infrastructure, or society around it yet. But the deeper problem, according to Altman, is that, again, we never really defined AGI in the first place. And instead of obsessing over that label, he shifts the focus to what actually matters next. Super intelligence. Not systems that are just smart in isolation, but systems that can outperform any human, even with AI assistance. Running companies, governments, and scientific labs. And when you line that up with everything else he talks about in this interview, enterprise scale, job shifts, massive compute bets, and a huge capability overhang, this really does feel like a new phase. So I'm curious what you guys think about all this. Did AGI already whoosh by? And are we still arguing over the wrong milestone? And more importantly, what do you think this next phase for OpenAI actually looks like? Let me know in the comments. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this breakdown, please feel free to drop a like. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.